as a former landscaper of many years, uh, how many have got lawn tips here in this church before? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty interesting. Uh, I got to give you another lawn tip today because uh, I have an issue with grubs. Do you know what they are? I mean, they're created like by Satan. Um, so like, what do they do? Well, I can give you a little history of like what they do. Uh, first of all, you have to realize that there's seven types of grubs. So if you go to the typical big box stores and you buy a chemical to kill grubs, they're probably only going to hit two of them, maybe three, which means do the math. You got four more eating away at your beautiful yard. So I know how the drill goes around here. Managing a yard here and doing turf management is a little different than California. I had to kind of reconnoiter to figure out how to do it. Uh, because I know the drill. Like come, come about April, your yard your starts waking up for the winter. Grass starts looking great. You throw a fertilizer on it, a little iron on it to green it up, make it lush, etc. cetera. Um, and then May, it's looking primo. June, not bad. July, what happens? What happened to it? So what do you do? You see it dying like in little spots here and there. So what do you do? What any homeowner would do? You go out, you pray over it. So what Christian people do? <laughs> you go out, you pray, oh God, what's going on in my yard, uh, etc. So uh, you throw fertilizer on it, you water it, you water it, you know, and no what happens? Nothing. Zero results. Uh, and it's just, it's amazing. So if you actually get down on your hands and knees and reach down and grab the grass uh, that's dead, uh, you can just grab it and it just comes right out. Why? It doesn't have any roots. This is a spiritual thing. <laughs> See where I'm going with this? You cannot work in your yard and not get a message, a word from God. So you reach down there. I did this the other day and I just, you know, pulled out some clumps and it just came right out. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. And when I pulled it out, some of the dirt came out and underneath it was a grub. And I know what, I know about them. And I've even put things down to kill them. But this year I've made some modifications. Because I realize there's seven varieties of grubs. And if I'm using the wrong stuff, I'm only killing a couple of them. I need to get rid of all of them so that I have a yard that honors God. <laughs> so what's the, what's the solution? I've actually had people say, I'm, you're not, I'm not inviting you over because I don't want you to see my yard. <laughs> Whole other issue. Um, I, I will come with deep sunglasses on or something. I just won't look. What do you need to do? What's the solution to your situation? Well, it, I'll show you the bag of this stuff. And you cannot buy it. You have to go to a nursery. This is grub killer plus. Uh, it's plus. Any guy, this, uh, some ladies are actually gardeners here too. You want the extra, don't you? Yeah. Right. Now, what's the plus? Well, the plus is a chemical called Dilox. After the last sermon, they weren't asking me spiritual questions about my sermon. They were wanting to know about Dilox. How do you spell that? Uh, how do you spell that? Uh, D-Y-L-O-X, Dilox. What's Dilox do? It wipes out all seven varieties of grubs. When should you apply it? Now. Now. Because your yard's probably already creamed, right? Am I right? Because I know a lot of you have stopped me and asked me, what's going on? Uh, so I've explained it to you, you know. And uh, so what you have to do is throw it out now. In fact, you should do it in August. Put it down, water it in, it forms a total barrier, kills them as it leaches into the ground because they're down underneath there eating your root system and they're going to eventually emerge as like a little bug and then eat your plants. It's a double whammy from Satan. <laughs> so get rid of them now and uh, this is the way you use it. What's the chemical? Dialox. And it's in that bear product called Grub Killer Plus. And the time to do it is now. Take radical action now because if you don't take radical action, you're going to have some same situation come next April or May. Saves me a whole lot of emails to have this discussion. So <laughs> treat it now and then do it again in April. In fact, I'll put it to you this way. Treat it with the months that begin with the letter A. What are your options? Well, I don't know. It's not September, October. It's got to be August and April. There you go. Put it on your calendar. That's what I do. I calendarize all this stuff so I know as you age... You're not going to forget when you see the calendar. Now, what has this got to do with anything? Everything. It is a spiritual experience because you must take radical action to deal with your grub issue, right? <laughs> Apply that to your life. There are godless grubs eating away at the lush, green, beautiful turf of your Christianity. You see what I'm saying? That's why I, I, I work in the yard I, f to hear from God. Godless grubs. I mean, that'll preach all day long. So Paul says, hey, once you are a believer, 
chapters one through 11 in the book of Romans. Once you're a believer, then you have every obligation to maintain the godless grub activity in your life. So he's gonna go through and begin to give you all these commands of things you should address with spiritual dialogues, like confession, meditation, reading the word of God, etc. So he's listed a whole bunch of these things. Uh, the godless grubs, what do they eat away at concerning your life, your spiritual turf? Uh, verse nine, they eat away at your love and give you a false form of love. Uh, they also eat away at your concept of evil, where you call things that are uh, evil, good. Uh, they, they, they flip around, uh, according to verse 10, your love of the family of God, that you don't really have a love for everybody. It's a conditional kind of love uh, when you go to uh, different churches. Uh, chapter uh, 12, verse 10, he says you have a problem with the uh, loving other family members, uh, accepting them, honoring them, because you get jealous because they're getting things, uh, promotions, etc., that you're not getting. So you have jealousy. He, this is a godless grub. Um, and then he says in verse 11, which we looked at last week, uh, it affects how you actually function as a believer in the body of Christ. But he wants to add some more godless grubs to that that you need to deal with because they're going to wipe out what? Your spiritual turf. And just as your yard should be maintained well as a Christian testimony to your neighborhood, <laughs> I'm just saying, remember, I've, I've tried to tell you two things. Uh, this is a sidelight. Adam was a gardener. You better get with the program. And they spoke Hebrew. You got to learn it. So anyway, back to my sermon. So think about it this way. What, what Paul's going to say, let me throw in two more godless grubs you should think about. Number one, verse 12, the first clause, he says, you must be radically righteous, radical, take radical action concerning hope. That's what he says. Uh, we'll put it up here in a couple translations. New American Standard Version says, rejoicing in hope. NIV says, be joyful in hope. And the Greek says, who knows what that says. <laughs> and we want to analyze that because it's so important because it's the inspired word of God. So every stroke of the pen is important because God said, these are the words that I chose. So we want to first realize that the command, and it's a command, it's an imperative, is built around a participle. And we know it's a participle because why? Because we go to this church. Yeah. yeah, what do you do at that church? We analyze grammar. It's totally amazing. This is a participle. It's a present tense participle. Uh, it's an active participle. Active voice means it's your, your responsibility to get on with the program here. He says you should be rejoicing, present tense command, all the time. There should be joy about your life. There should not be anything uh, said about a Christian as they're, just being around them is kind of a bummer. I know it's a 60s term, but I think it's Hebrew somehow. Um, they're just not happy. They're, they're so depressed all the time. No, Paul says you should be one that's known for what? Rejoicing in hope, in hope. Now, what I find most interesting here, which I'll point out to you with my trusty clicker, is let's go down to the Greek text for just a moment. You gonna come with me? Yeah. Okay, all right. So let's look at the Greek. This is uh, the participle uh, to be rejoicing. Uh, but this right here, this is the word um, uh, for hope. This word right here is the hope. It's an article. Because if you, left, if you left that out and made it an arthritis and left that out, it would be rejoicing in a hope. No, he said. He said rejoicing in the hope. This is a qualitative hermeneutical difference when you study this whole clause, is it not? Because he's not just saying, hey, just walk around, just be happy. He's saying, no, be happy because you're focusing on the hope. That's eschatological. Eschaton, the Greek word for the end. This is thinking about the end of what's coming. I was at my daughter's house uh, last year in Sacramento and was driving down a street uh, that I hadn't been down before, and I noticed they'd built a brand new rest home, and they had named it Eschaton. Huh? <laughs> I don't think the Californians are Greek. Hey, that sounds like a cool term for the rest home. We'll call it Eschaton. Do you know what that means? It means the end. <laughs> I, I told my daughter, it's like, do you know what that means? No, I do, after six years of Greek. Uh, it means the end. Never check me in there. <laughs> you know? Anyway, back to my sermon. So we gotta rejoice in hope, eschaton, in the end. So like, what is the hope? Well, this, this is a whole sermon series in and of itself. I'll just give you a couple. Uh, ideas to whet your spiritual appetite. What is the hope I should be focusing on that's coming in the future for the Christian? Number one, uh, we have hope in the rapture of the church of Christ Amen. before the tribulation. And that's a whole nother sermon series in and of itself. I can defend it, but the rapture is different from the second coming because in the rapture we go up and we don't come back down. In the second coming, we come back down with them. 
So it's either we go up, we're married to Christ, it's the body of Christ, to, to Jesus the groom, and we come back down after seven years when the tribulation's over, or we go up and we come right back down. I'm not for that view. We go up with Christ. How do I know that? Well, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, people were worried about Christians who had died. And Paul says, but we don't want you to be uninformed, or the King James, I believe, says ignorant, brethren, about those who are asleep, which is a euphemism in Greek for death. So that you will not grieve as, the, as, as they do as the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, again because the death and resurrection of Christ changes everything. It's the difference between Christianity and all other religions. God left the throne of heaven, took our sin, rose the third day. The resurrection changes everything. He says if you believe that Christ died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep, which is a euphemism in Greek for what? Death. He will bring those who've fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord. He said, I got this by way of inspiration from the Spirit. That we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord, we will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For if the Lord, the Lord himself would descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, when that happens and remain, uh, we'll be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Why? At any moment, you could hear the shofar horn go off. If you're a believer, you shouldn't be going, uh-oh. You should be going, awesome, I'm out of here. Who's going up first? What did Paul say? Dead in Christ. Who's that? My dad. My, my dad's mom, my grandma, Liz's sister that died when she was 33 from cancer. I mean, all those who are dead in Christ, they go up first, instantly. They're in heaven right now, but they're going to get that resurrected body suited for heaven. Whole nother sermon series. <laughs> See, job security <laughs> for me. Because these things are, you can dig down into all of these things, but they leave the, uh, when the horn is sounded, they'll hear it too. They, their body is reunited with their body. It's glorified like Christ's body. They go up first and we go up with them. Don't worry about if you leave your clothes or not. Did you hear me? I've been asked all kinds of strange questions. I've got that one a zillion times. I'm kind of wondering, are my clothes going to be there? Like, you know, I don't really care. I mean, just as long as I'm going, I don't care what my Levi's or whatever. <laughs> Day of judgment. Oh, well, and there has to be the rapture of the church because the 70th week of Daniel, Daniel 9, 24 to 27, says that God has to finish his dealings with Israel. So the church has to be out of the way. Whole another concept. But what's the hope that we have as Christians? One day the horn sounds. We're out of here. Now, I think this afternoon the Redskins are playing. Is this true? Yeah. And I learned from Darren. I think he's, Lisa, are you here? Yeah. Yeah, Lisa's here. Uh, is he not going to the game? Whatever. Yeah, he's a Dallas Cowboy fan. We'll pray for him. But just imagine if, imagine if the trumpet sounded during the game. You know what I'm saying? Quarterback goes out the back to pass. He's out of there. Maybe his uniform's there. Maybe not. He's gone. I mean, imagine if a lot of people disappeared. And all the saints would be going, awesome. Paul says, you should not be upset about what's going on in the world. Be excited about the hope that one day the, the, the trumpet sounds. And we go up to be with Christ. Number two, we have a hope of the coming of Christ, the second coming of Christ. Because Jesus talks about it in, in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24. But ti uh, in Titus chapter 2, Paul talks about it this way. Titus 2, verse 13. He says, we are looking as Christians for the blessed hope in the appearing of the glory, the doxa, uh, the, the brilliance of our great God and Savior, who? Christ Jesus. We're looking for that. Why? Because he's coming back. And he's going to come back uh, in the second coming to establish his empire on this old earth and replace all political systems, which desperately need help, don't they? We have the hope of that. Number three, we have hope of, the realized, uh, of realized eternal life in God's glorious presence. We have hope of realized eternal life. So here's a question. Bible trivia, we're playing the game. We're, you're trying to move your peace around. We're having fun. When you trust Christ as your Savior, do you get eternal life then or later? How many would say you get it right then? Excellent. How many say later? How many don't know? You get it right then. What did Jesus, well, Jesus, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but what? Has what? Has everlasting life. Later? 
No, you have it. He gives it to you. This is the hope of the Christian. I got life now. When I'm with a saint who dies, as tragic as that is, you got to be thinking to yourself, the next breath they took's in heaven. Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, that'll preach all day long. And, and Paul says, hey, we have the hope of realized eternal life because I, I have it by faith now. I have it. It's realized in God's mind. In my mind, it's, it's by faith. But at that moment of death, when that happens, and by the way, we're not all getting out of here alive, right? Yeah, it was my friend Rick Seeley telling me when he was passing away from pancreatic cancer, he's like, I don't know why you guys are all crying. We're not all getting out here alive. I'm like, spoken like a true uh, homicide detective, you know? Uh, he was the chief of homicide. But anyway, uh, we were having communion with him before he died, and he, we were all crying, and he's just sitting there smiling. I'm like, Rick. But anyway, whole other story. Um, so he, he, the, uh, in, uh, when he died, what was Rick's next, next breath? Heaven. It was realized that he had all that God was promising to give him. What hope is that? What did Paul say? You should be rejoicing in the hope of what lies ahead. Uh, we have hope that we shall eventually be completely conformed to Christ. I mean, to his holiness, to his likeness. How do I know that? Because John talked about it in 1 John chapter 3. He says, see how, uh, with what a great love the Father has bestowed upon us that we would all be called the children of God and such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us, or they can't figure out Christians, that's what he's saying, uh, because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet appeared as what we shall be, but we know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we will see him as he is, and everyone who has this hope fixed uh, on him purifies himself just as he's pure. I mean, as I think about when, when Christ appears, whether it's at the rapture or whether he calls me home with a heart attack or whatever God does, that when I see him, I shall instantly conform to his likeness. Awesome day. Awesome day. Just the thought of that moves to purity because if I'm going to be conformed to his likeness, then should I not be doing that now? Getting rid of the godless grubs, wiping out my spiritual turf. Remember the old song, Face to Face with Christ my Savior? You know that song? You don't know that song? Face to face with Christ my Savior, face to face, what will it be? When with rapture I behold him, Jesus Christ who died for me. The chorus, face to face, I shall behold him. Far beyond the starry sky, face to face in all of his glory, his brilliance of his glory, I'll see him by and by. That's how I function. I look forward to what comes ahead because we'll eventually be conformed to him when we see his face. He says we have hope also that we, that we currently possess a spiritual inheritance that cannot be analyzed, classified, or described. I put that in for DC types. It cannot be analyzed, classified, or described. The inheritance that you have in Christ. How do I know that? Well, well Peter talks about it. First Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God of our Father and Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Remember I told you resurrection changes everything. Uh, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away. It's reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Your salvation is secure in Jesus. But he said he's, he's got an inheritance waiting for you. It's not like your earthly inheritance. Uh, tonight about 6 o'clock Liz and I are flying to San Diego. Why? Uh, because her mom, I mean, for the last two years, her heart capacity has been at 13%. And so we've been out there, I don't even, I think I own Southwest Airlines. We've flown out there so many times. Um, but we've been doing care in the home. So her stepfather has dementia. Her mom has a failing heart. A very sad situation. Uh, so we've been, the family's been paying, you know, 10000 a month for home care for her mom. And then plus their bills of 5000 a month in San Diego. You do the math. How long can someone sustain that? I'm in charge of the estate, the finances, and I crunch the numbers, and it's like, you have three months, and you have no cash. What do we do, what do, we do with them? I'm pretty good at problem solving, putting together, you know, charts to figure out if not this, then this, if this, then this. So I, I put together nine options that we have as a family. There were, none of them were fun. And I realized, you know, we've got to do something here because they're going to run out of money. So we need to sell the house. That's where all their money is. But they're in the house, and so uh, God reached down from heaven and provided means whereby we could move them. But the point being, when we go out there to, 
tonight to fly, to spend the whole week there getting the, ready, the house ready to sell. I've done this before, but there's more to do. Because um, dry rot has a ten- tendency to come back and paint needs to be touched up, all that stuff. We're going to paint all week. But when I look at Liz's inheritance, because this is her inheritance, her mom's estate, to provide for her mom and stepfather. But if they pass away, this is Liz's inheritance. It's totally perishable. It's totally perishable. And when you think about that, you have to fly out there again, do all this, fix this, paint that, wash this, power wash that, etc. It's the law of uh, entropy, right? It's constantly breaking things down. It doesn't exist in heaven. Your inheritance cannot fade away. Never needs to be painted. Nobody has to come stage the house to sell it. We're going to try to stage the house. That's going to be interesting. <laughs> anyway, so pray for us as we go out there that God would help us. But, but God's telling us here, you know, when you're a Christian, you should be focused on the hope of what lies ahead. There's an old song uh, that we used to sing as Christians a um, long time ago. Uh, and I remember it. Remember that song? How many remember this song? Rejoice in the Lord. Think you could sing it? Let's do it. I'm not Darren. Even if I shaved my head, it wouldn't help me. Okay, so, Lisa, just go with it, okay? You ready? Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice, and again I say rejoice. Stop. Okay, now, one of my pet Christian peeves when I was a young man is like, I would tell my mom, that's the song that never ends. <laughs> it's true. Didn't you think that when you were younger? Yeah. We used to sing that in an antiphonal fashion when I was younger. You know what that means? So we start this part of the church with... Re- Yeah, rejoice in the Lord. Oh, and then, then they would start, and then they would start, and then they would start, and then the truly spiritual up there would start. And <laughs> Rejoice in the Lord always. Why should we be rejoicing? What did Paul say? Remember the article before the word hope? Because we of all people have what? The hope. Par excellence use of the article. Point number two. I'm still in half the verse. <laughs> and you just read quickly through this stuff. Uh, the next thing he said, Godless grub you need to deal with is called tribulation, affliction. He says you should be radically righteous toward tribulation that comes your way. You cannot get through life and not have some affliction. And if you think you became a Christian to escape affliction, I got news. Because God uses affliction to get your attention. Notice what Paul says. Rejoicing in hope, and then he throws in persevering and tribulation. And then the NIV says, that word we all love, patient in affliction. Really? I have to ask you, are you persevering in your affliction? Are you being patient in it? Etc. cetera. We, we want to analyze this. This is too, too, too important. Again, it is a present active participle, meaning what? Perpetual activity. Not only should be, you should be known for joy as the person in the room with joy, you should be known as a person that no matter what is thrown your way, you don't leave your post. Now, this is interesting. The word that he uses here for persevering, it's hupomeno in Greek. Hupomeno is a preposition, hupo, wedded to a verb, meno, to remain. You wed those two together, like German staples words together. When I took four years of German, I was amazed at how long the words could be. They take up like a sentence. Why don't they just, the Germans just break them up? <laughs> Anybody study German here? Nobody? Ah, they're good. Hey, Oscar Seidnit, thank you. Uh, now, now think of this. He's, he, he's going to say, he's going to take a preposition. He's going to wed it to a verb. What's that do to the verb? I've told you this before. What's it do to it? It intensifies it. So he's saying, don't just kind of persevere in affliction. Super do it. Now think about this. Hupomeno. Hupomeno is a Greek word. It's a military term, which means to refuse to leave your post. Hear me? Now, when you're in affliction, what do you want to do? Man, I, I don't like what the doctor just said. I got to get out of here. I mean, I, I got to get away from this. I got to, no. He says, don't, don't leave your post. Uh, do you remember uh, the Battle of Beston? Not that you were there, but, I mean, yeah, yeah. 
Some, some might have been there. But the Battle of the Bulge, remember Bastogne? They're surrounded by the Germans. Got the Panzers. They got everything. It's over for the Americans. They're outnumbered, outgunned. They got armor. We, we're, we're toast. So remember they sent two German officers with a white flag to go talk to our guys? They basically tell them, you're outnumbered, outgunned. It's over. Just surrender. So they take the two German soldiers. They blindfold them. They take them to our command post. Uh, and they get word from our commanding officer. His response to you need to resender, resurrender was what? One monosyllabic word. Nuts. Nuts. That's all he said. And the Germans are like, was ist los with nuts? <laughs> yeah. So, so remember, so they, you seen the movie? Yeah, so, they, so they go back to the commanding officers, the German officers, and they say, you know, what, uh, what did the Americans say? Uh, they said, nuts. <laughs> you know, <laughs> What does this mean? What does this mean, this cryptic saying? What were they saying? This is GI's talking. What were they saying? We're not, uh-uh. Bastone is ours. We're not caving. We're not leaving our post. Hupomeno. You can throw all you want of affliction at us. We're not leaving. I don't know. Was this the Airborne? I think this was Airborne, was it not? 101st? Was it 101st? Yes. Yes. Were you there? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're not going anywhere. It's all Americana. See, this is spiritual stuff. Paul says, rejoice in hope and be patient in affliction. You do not leave your post. Now I want to actually get into this. So this is the intro to that. Just, we got to get into this. He says, he said, I want you to be patient or persevere in tribulation. Tribulation is the Greek word thlipsis, which means outer pressure applied to something to crush it. If you're a man or a woman, like tools, think of the, of the vice on your, on your, on your uh, workbench. You put something in there, and if you turn too, too hard, you crush it. I've broken lots of things. But it's, it's that. It's like cranking, you're crushing it. You ever feel like that in your life? I, I've been there. And it's like, it's tribulation. So he says, persevere when your life is being crushed by tribulation, by the pressure of tribulation. I introduce to you Thor the Mountain. <laughs> this guy's all over the map. We're talking about grubs. We're talking about, yeah, it's all spiritual stuff. You ever heard of Thor the mountain? He's, he's similar to my size. <laughs> I mean, think about this guy. He's picking up 550 pounds over his head. Do you know how much weight that is? Imagine if his body could speak. What would the joints be saying? What are you doing? They'd be screaming at him. Talk, talk about pressure on the, on the joints picking up this kind of weight. But see, he's going to himself, this weight's going up. This is the, this is the strongman content. This is going up. And so he, he doesn't cave to the pressure. He uses his strength to push through the pressure. See, this is a spiritual thing. When Paul says, persevere, uh, don't leave your post in tribulation. When you get in a pressurized situation, whether it's a doctor's report, or maybe your boss gave you some news you don't like, or whatever it is, you can fill in the blank. It's not hard to do. You already have your finger on what it is. God's telling you what? Don't leave your post. Don't leave your post. Now we need to get into why. He didn't say why, but I need to give you why. Why should you not leave your post? Uh, number one, the Lord is the Lord of the pressurized situation. He's Lord of it. How do I know that? Well, Isaiah chapter 45, verse 7, the Lord says, I form light, I create darkness, I bring prosperity, I create disaster. Who is he? He's the Lord of the pressurized situation. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 4, 14 uh, says, in, in the day of prosperity, be happy, be happy, but in the day of adversity, consider. God has made the one as well as the other so that man will not discover anything that will be after him. God brings it into your life to educate you about who he is. He's Lord of the pressurized situation. Number two, why you shouldn't desert your post. Tribulation will burn out the sinful dross in your life. Boy, will it. It will show you, if you ask God, in my pressurized situation, show me my sin, he will waste no time showing you your sin. And this is a, a metallurgy term here uh, that he's using here. Uh, uh, in 1 Peter chapter 4, notice the metallurgy term. He says, beloved, don't be surprised at the fiery trial. That's burning out the dross and metal to make it pure. That has is, uh, that is, uh, come to you, which comes upon you for your testing, uh, as though some strange thing were happening to you. Peter says, don't worry about what you're going through, this fiery trial. God's just burning out the dross. 
You should be asking God, show me in my situation what godless grub is in my life that needs to go. And then that's what you confess. Third, tribulation deepens your understanding of the character of God. Boy, does it. Isaiah says, speaking for God, chapter 55, for as the high heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways. They're higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Are they not? God's thoughts are so much greater. And so when you go through tribulation, you must say, God, I'm finite, you're infinite. You must see things I can't see and understand things that are beyond my spiritual pay grade. I will walk in faith before you. Because if you go back to Daniel chapter one, verse two, and you read how young Daniel in 605 BC wound up in captivity, he's a teenager. But it says in chapter one, when the book starts, uh, that God orchestrated the Babylonian captivity. It says so. And then God put that young man in the right spot to move him up into the Babylonian government to protect his people. Boy, don't tell me God doesn't have greater thoughts than we do. That's why you shouldn't abandon your post. Uh, next, tribulation uh, sets you up to witness the unveiling of the power of God, his hand. He sets you in a situation where he's gonna force you to see the power of his hand when he moves. I submit to you in closing, uh, my life with my wife for the last couple months has been unbelievably pressurized. I mean, from a variety of ways with her mother and, and uh, stepfather. This is sad Be because it was a no-win situation in many different ways. Her mother had been suicidal. Hospice wrote that into the notes. And so we found out no place will take her in, in, in San Diego because she said that. And believe me, we tried. So there she is. We can't afford the care because the money's running out and no one will take her. And then we have a dementia patient who's combative, mean, and won't leave the house. So even if we get her out, what do we do with him, et cetera? And he was an aviator in the, in the Korean War. So we're like, what, like, what do we do? So I came up with, I, I told you, nine options. All my options were not optimal. And we looked at the options and they're not pleasant to do. And then a couple of weeks ago, about three weeks ago, uh, God moved in a spectacular way in the pressurized situation. I mean, he went past my nine options, just like God to come up with option 10. And he did it in one week. Because when we were sitting here looking at the running out of money, what are we gonna do? God stepped in and goes, oh, I got this. So what did he do? I'll tell you what he did. Uh, he, uh, regarding her mom, Liz's brother used to own a large foreign car repair shop in North County, San Diego. One of his customers uh, had just lost his father, so Mark was talking to his buddy, and he, he happened to ask the guy, hey, before your dad died, where was he? Well, he was in this beautiful care, board and care home. They took care of him until he passed away. They were awesome. What, what's the name of the place? So we called him. Within one day, she was in there. Wow. <gasps> they took her without a question. Unbelievable. God moved. I, we just sat back in awe at the kitchen table. And then we're like, okay, she's now in there. Great care. Now what do we do with Andy? Well, there was a, a young lady that the family had hired to take care of her mom during the day. Her name's Kelly. And Kelly said one day, you know, I take care of another elderly man. I take him to the VA in Escondido, and I know some people at the VA. I, I could talk to them about Andy. We're like, yeah. She goes that day, goes and talks to the guy she knows, refers us to a social worker. Her name's Jewel. Boy, is she a Jewel. Um, she then was the hands and feet of Christ to us. Within one week, that same week, she had placed Andy and, and got us registered for assistance to a war vet. Amen. It's unbelievable. And we didn't, and the day that he, we told him you're gonna have to go to leave the home so we can sell the home, he who had been belligerent and angry and mad and everything uh, forever, when they gave him his boxes to pack up his few little belongings, he went willingly and did it and said nothing. And when they took him to the home this Monday, he went willingly. You have no idea what this means. Because he wasn't willing. He went willing. I'm like, the Holy Ghost has got him somehow. And, and the, he went in there. He had a really rough day Monday. And then they told us on Wednesday, hey, we don't know what happened with him. But he's, he's a total introvert. Total. He's visiting people in other rooms. He's walking around with other people talking. He's eating food that we had never touched before, like eggs. He's eating real good food instead of junk food, Twinkies and stuff. He's eating good food. He's walking around out back talking to people instead of trying to break out, which he tried to do Monday. <laughs> <laughs> Why 
What happened? He's, he's actually going out and watching TV with other war vets. It's amazing. Now, I'm not saying every day is going to be amazing like that, but what did God do? He goes, I got this. I, I'll, put, I'll put them both in a place that will care for them, and then you guys can sell the house. Now I'm worried about the house selling. <laughs> isn't, it, isn't it? God has got that. But please pray as we get on the plane tonight at 6 o'clock that God has a buyer for that house. But I told Liz, if God moved this way, selling the home is going to be no problemo. It's going to happen. What did God say? Two things here. God will scrubs. Two things. You should be rejoicing constantly and the hope of what lies ahead. And number two, persevere in your tribulation because he's going to move and show you his glory. Amen to that. Let's pray. God, we uh, give you glory. And that's enough right there. You are worthy. In Christ's name, amen. God bless you.